Chris Conway from the Australian Stock Report is joining us live from our Melbourne studio. Chris, good afternoon. Great to see you then. Thanks for joining us. Now, given the pretty uninspiring lead, you would say, from the US, it's probably no surprise seeing a pretty flat day of trade today. I would agree with you 100%, Leanne. Good afternoon. Yeah, look, quiet, quiet leads from uh, Wall Street overnight and I think today's session is a bit of a microcosm of what's going on more broadly at the moment in the market and that's that we're waiting for the next catalyst. Um, you know, the market is sort of just churning above this 5600 level, uh, waiting to see what happens uh, as we lead into uh, local reporting season. Uh, obviously it has already kicked off, but in earnest I guess you'd say um, as we move through uh, the rest of this month. So. Yeah, market's waiting for a bit of a catalyst. Technically, we've pulled back into a level that was previously uh, resistance, um, and everyone's just waiting for the next shoe to drop, the next big thing to happen. Yeah, you sort of get this feeling we're almost in a, in a holding pattern right now, waiting for that catalyst, as you say. What do you think that could be? A lot of pointing to this reporting season. Do you think that'll be the catalyst to see the market moving higher? Yeah, I do. I, I'm actually still bullish. My, my outlook for the, the 200 is bullish. Um, I think as we move through and post-reporting season, we can get a leg higher. Um, I think, you know, there's some potential positive um, surprises to our earnings season. Um, the Trump reflation trade should help companies with uh, offshore earnings. Uh, the retail space uh, had a pretty good Christmas anecdotally, so that would be nice to see that flow through to uh, numbers of the retailers. Um, there's possible capital um, surprises, you know, with, say, BHP and Rio returning more capital to shareholders. We all know about the commodity story. We'll probably talk about it a bit more later. Mm. So I think generally the results will be um, probably at worst neutral, hopefully slightly positive, uh, and then that will feed into as well the whole Trump reflation trade, as I've already spoken about. Mm. Now, we've seen the market pulling back. I mean, we saw that sharp rally after November, but since then, we've pulled back into that 5,600 region, and the A6200 right now is about 5,611. Are you still bullish? Because I know I've spoken to you before, and you have been certainly bullish on the outlook. Does that remain the case? Yeah, it does. I, I will happily admit, though, Leanne, I don't know whether too many other people on this show admit when they've got things wrong, but I was expecting more of a melt-up post-Trump. Um, I had been on the show saying that I thought 6,000 was achievable pretty quickly. Uh, obviously, we ro rotated lower from there pretty much the moment that I made that prediction. So happy to put my hand up and say that I got that wrong. But I am still bullish. Um, and like I said, for the reasons that I just suggested, I don't think reporting season will be bad. I think it will be neutral to slightly positive. Um, and then, you know, the Trump reflation trade. OK, sure, Trump's doing and saying some things now that are causing a bit of consternation in markets. That's likely to uh, continue to be the case for at least the first 100 days. But then if he gets anywhere near his projected growth, US growth target of 4%, look, I don't think he will do it, but even if he got 25 to 3%, it's a drastic improvement on what we've seen recently from the US. The US economy is, is more robust than it has been previously. Um, you know, and that could propel US equities higher and indeed uh, Australian equities higher as well. There's also the rotation out of bonds um, and hopefully into the equity market as well. So there's a few positive catalysts that I see post our reporting season and provided it's not bad, that can drive this market higher. All right. Fantastic. Um, now let's get into some of the movers today, down at EDI specifically. It's in fact the best performing stock on the market right now. It's raised its full year profit guidance and it really seems like that diversification away from mining services has been the right move for Downer. What were some of the key takeaways for you? Oh, Leanne, that was the key takeaway uh, for me. Uh, it's their diversification away from uh, mining services. This is a process that they started quite some time ago. Um, I remember, you know, probably speaking within the last 12 months on the show about the fact that they were moving away from mining services, a sector which for them continues to contract as well. Um, and they were moving towards, you know, more so their rail division and things of that nature. The concern that I had at the time was that, um, you know, the public tendering process had become such a competitive one that a lot of these companies were lobbying very low bids or, or bids with um, quite thin margins. margins. Um, and there was the potential for cost blowouts. Um, it was uh, Downer, of course, that had the, I think, $117 million blowout on their Waratah project in Sydney um, in 2015 or, or, or early 2016, I can't quite remember. So there was the concern there that by, yeah, having such thin margins on these, on these low bids in order to win contracts, that if there were any cost blowouts, 
it was going to uh, you know, negatively impact the share price. But they've managed to avoid all of those. Um, and in the last two quarters, they've managed to win $20 billion in contracts, uh, $2 billion for the Metro contract uh, down here in Melbourne. That's the train line down here in Melbourne. And another billion-dollar contract for a Sydney rail line. So those concerns, they've absolutely abated them. As you say, profit upgrade. Um, not surprising to see the price, share price you know, up 15% mm. uh, today. All right, fantastic. Let's move on to some of those other commodity stocks. Actually, in fact, a couple of stocks that you're looking at holding right now, two of those being South32 and Newcrest. Tell us a little, a little why you like the story for these two resource stocks. Yeah, so South32, it's really just a play on the, on the, on the broad commodity story. Um, again, going back to Trump reflation, going back to uh, the fact that China hard landing is almost all but off the table now. Um, you know, I think the commodity story is one that is going to continue to run. Again, I come from the perspective of probably not looking beyond about the next quarter, uh, and I think that uh, commodities continu can continue to run for at least the next quarter. I don't think we'll necessarily see the 40% rise in commodities that we saw last year, um, but already so far this year they're up 6%. So there's evidence there to suggest that the, uh, the rise in commodities is ongoing. Um, Again, Trump reflation, China not falling off a cliff. But the other thing as well is spot prices are so far beyond most of the prices that uh, analysts have plugged into their models. I'll take iron ore just as, as an example, 80, circa $83 currently, probably about 50% above where most analysts uh, have it sitting in their models. Um, so there's, there's a potential re-rating to the upside there and a fairly significant one as well. Um, and even if commodity prices were to fall, say, 10% uh, across the board from where they are now, they're still going to be sitting above those prices that analysts have plugged into their models. So the, the chances for a re-rating, again, remain very high. Um, so I, I still see positives there. And it's pretty much at the moment the only space that, uh, as a trader, I'm, I'm really, I, I would say I'm really, really interested in. Mm. Some of the themes that we saw in the back half of last year, like um, the rotation back into large caps after previously being in small caps uh, and then selling down bond proxies, you know, like your Sydney airports and names like that, those themes for me, they've dried up. I, I wouldn't go buying the banks now. Um, I wouldn't be selling Sydney Airport, for example. Um, so the, the commodity play to me is really the only one worth having a crack at in the near term, which is why I like South32. They've got some good assets. I would throw BHP in there. I would put FMG in there as well. Um, you know, continues to pay down debt, paid down a billion dollars in the last quarter. Four billion debt now, sitting on 1.2 billion in cash. Um, they continue to, del to deliver. Um, and probably oil I like as well, and the pick in that space would be Woodside, just best of breed in, in, amongst the oilers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you certainly painted a pretty positive picture there for this commodity story to, to remain uh, a solid one. If we just focus on or, or hone in on, on gold, I mean, it has been doing well, often seen as a safe haven play there, and if we do continue to see that volatility, certainly as President Trump's policies play out and so forth, do you think we could continue to see that gold price rising? Yeah, I do. But that's the caveat, though, Leanne, is that, um, you know, Trump has to keep saying and doing somewhat silly things for the gold price to continue to benefit from those safe haven flows. Um, we like uh, Newcrest in the space. We currently hold it. Um, and the reason why is I call it, you know, a bit of a Trump hedge. Um, if he does do something particularly stupid to royal markets more than he already has, I think it's worthwhile having some exposure to gold. Um, what I would say on that front, though, is, look, at the, to this point, he's only done what he said he was going to do all throughout his election campaign. So it's not like he's done something completely uh, uh, left of, left of, uh, you know, out of left field. Mm. Um, he's done the things that he said he was going to mm. do. People might not, might not like them, but over time they're going to have to get used to the fact that, that that's, that, that's the way it is. So the first 100 days are likely to be the most volatile in terms of, you know, and we've already seen it, signing executive orders doing things that people don't like. Um, but after that first 100 days, I expect things to settle down. People will realise that this is the new landscape and they will invest, um, you know, uh, at a company level and indeed at an individual level buying and selling shares uh, accordingly. Mm. Um, people will just get on with what they need to do. And there's no doubt he's moved pretty quickly in putting those uh, words into action there. Um, Chris, look, we're going to wrap it up there. But as always, it's been wonderful having you on. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, for being patient and hanging on there. Thank you. Anytime, Leanne. Thank you very much. Chris Conway joining us there live from the Australian Stock Report.